repeater while I was driving in today. Raspberry Pi. So the difference between the Raspberry Pi is actually a whole computer on board. This is uh, an entire computer on board with audio, uh, graphics, keyboard, mouse, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the whole banana. Where these are just individual chips. This is just a chip, that's just a chip. And this is a small circuit board that's up there running the small display. So uh, back into the book. I've given you quite a bit of introduction. Basic, we use the basic language uh, for the uh, pickaxe and the C programming language for the Arduino and anything Linux. And then in the, the Raspberry Pi, we use uh, Python, seems to be the favorite language, and it's kind of not basic. We don't have any of this stuff obvious, it's really not all that hard. Uh, the software is pretty much free in all cases. Uh, and some of them include some very powerful debug tools. I worked in the very old mainframes, and uh, 19 years of age, I was about uh, 62, I worked in the, uh, in the information systems, uh, both hardware, software, firmware, operating systems, accounting systems, etc. So anyway, a huge resource out there, and it's all free. For high-speed items, we have what's called an I2C bus. You'll see this in the future. You may not know about it right now, but I noticed that QST Magazine is doing more and more microprocessor projects. There's one in this month's uh, QST that just arrived today. You can start seeing things like I2C. It's a very high-speed two-wire bus, that bus. So instead of your old 9600 baud connection to your packet TNC, well, now it's 200 kb or more. Uh, these are some of the projects in there. Uh, the author did a lot with APRS. He had two young children. He built a very special APRS gear, very miniaturized, uh, for the, each kid's bicycle. So when the, his uh, son or daughter got on the bike to leave school, he knew it. It was right on the screen. As soon as the bike jiggled, it triggered the APRS, and the APRS started operating normally. So he built uh, quite a few things for APRS. Out of the water. It's scratchy program. Uh, an APRS data logger, and uh, it's got a multi mode transmitter shield. It also has a very slow uh, CW. The QRSS, uh, for you guys that have never been on CW, you're missing a lot. Anyway, there's a very, very slow speed that anybody can copy. Uh, it's called QRSS, and the thing about it is it's uh, a very excellent DX capability. So uh, there are specialized websites where they monitor your CW signal and uh, tell you how far you've gone. Kind of like Whisper. How many people know about Whisper? Oh, good. More than I thought. Whisper? Okay, great. And you know, I'll let you tell the guy sitting next to you. Um, another data logger, what you do, a data logger logs events. These are kind of nice. Uh, so in this case, this person has taken the data logger, it has a real time clock in it, and every once in a while he samples the temperature, the frequency, and the voltage. Uh, you, can, you can have it sample the chemicals in your swimming pool or the ground temperature of your tomato garden. Um, I did that, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, then you built an APRS IV uh, to the internet. The pickaxe key here. This is a real nice project uh, to start with. Uh, the solar tracker is fairly easy. Here's a nice little CW key or one chip. <coughs> this is a really cool timer uh, for your handheld, so uh, it, it reminds you to uh, key up so the alligator doesn't get you. Uh, the fella made the chip a little sensitive to RF, and it's just a very simple project. So this would be a very simple project. <coughs> Let me move ahead. Uh, here's the solar tracker I've talked about quite a bit. Uh, so it, generally in the morning, I just point in the general direction of the rising sun. You probably haven't noticed because of where we live, but there's really quite a difference in the sun angles and the uh, azimuth and the elevation both between wintertime and summertime. And because I go to Quartz Fest every year, the sun is very low along the horizon. So my solar panels on the roof, they're worthless because they're straight, they're pointing straight up. So they probably get about 10% of the power. 
So I have my solar panels, uh, two 43 watt panels, mounted on a tripod out, out front of the motorhome. So three or four times a day, I shift them over. You know, I got the 8 o'clock position, the 11 a.m. position, the 2 p.m. position, and the 5 p.m. position. And after that, it's beer time. Forget it. Uh, so I built a great big one, and it follows the sun across, and it also tracks the elevation. And it'll hold a 20-pound panel. But for the book, I wanted to make something very small, and this just does the, uh, uh, the uh, azimuth. Uh, so during the summer, the sun's going directly over your head, and that's really hard to track. Uh, but I'm able to do it you now with the other tracker. And this one, you would manually adjust the angle of the panel. But it will follow the sun because the, this little flag right here is a major component. It's very, very important to have that flag, create a shadow. This is the circuit. So how easy could this be? You have your microprocessor chip. You have a little bit of supporting uh, components, but not very much, huh? You have a little 5-volt regulator. It's a 5-volt operated chip. It has a, a little regulator dial that's necessary here. And here are the two green sensors that you see on the black box. Leads directly into the chip. Chip's looking at the two sensors and tell me what you see. And uh, depending on the condition of the, of the uh, voltage generated by the green LEDs, certain things happen in the logic, outputs a signal through the, a, a little current limiting resistor into this driver. Everybody recognizes the motor right here. It either drives it forward or reverse as a current capability of one amp. And right now I'm operating it at uh, four and a half to six volts. Draws 180 milliamps when the motor starts. So how simple is that? Um, and like I said, you can make this do other things by just replacing these two LEDs with 5K pots. And when the voltages are equal, the signal over here to the driver chip is going to be uh, off and nothing's going to move. And depending on what you do, over here, it's going to drive the motor either forward or reverse. So all the really intricate circuitry is inside this little, uh, see, I think this is an 18-inch chip. I forgot. Anyway, like $2. This chip's about two and a half bucks. And this one is about two and a half bucks. Then if you want to uh, limit the left-right movement, you can put some switches up here that enable or disable uh, the motor chip. So that's typical of many projects. This, all of this over here is just to program. This is a programming interface. So here's your transmit serial pin to your PC's COM port, and your receive serial pin goes over here to pin seven. It's gonna share right here. And that is all that's needed for programming. It's just the two resistors and a couple of wires. I won't go through this, but this is what the logic reads uh, to initialize the chip. Up here, you initialize the chip. You tell the one pin it's going to be an analog digital converter. And you turn it on over here with a couple of bits. And then we clear out a few variables. I just stuck that there to be funny. That's not really needed. Uh, and then a few notes about how I pulse the motor. Take a half a second pause. And then I go in and I start looking at those LEDs deciding what I want to do, set up a little software bias, move the motor one way or the other, or do nothing at all, and then simply right here, go to main, go all the way back here, and repeat the whole process forever. And here's why I set my 10, 10 second samples. Uh, so it's not looking at the sun all the time. So that was one example. Uh, this is the little keyer that you see over here on the table that I made for Sydney uh, last year. So this is what I made for K6BMT. Here's Sydney Station along the river in the Amazon. And here it is plugged in his TS, uh, I mean his uh, IC7000. Uh, Running off buddy poles, LIFEPO4 batteries. Didn't make any contacts. And uh, I understand the Amazon is, a, is really an RS sponge. So uh, it's too bad we didn't hear it. This is the circuit 
or the keyer. Here's your chip, your mic same microprocessor chip, it has OEM too. Here's the same programming circuitry, no big deal there. There's the key switch, just the transistor, grounding out the key line to the TS to the uh, transceiver right here. And a little LED to blink so you know it's turned on. And by the way, if you leave this on in the programming, it only runs for about 10 minutes and automatically turns itself off. And then to turn it back on, you just turn the switch off back on and it uh, continues. So this is very easy. This probably replaces about 30, 40, 50 components and a whole lot of soldering. And then if you decide you want to try something else, you plug in your PC right here and reprogram it to do something else. I was going to tell you it took me six months to develop. No. <laughs> Okay, I won't go through this, but this is how it sends Morse code. You put uh, some alphanumeric characters in memory that represent dots and dashes or your call letters or whatever message you want to transmit. So you probably want to say uh, uh, something like what I would do is K6ACJ slash PY1 for portable. And uh, I might repeat that a few times, CQ, whatever, and then stop for two or three minutes because he's on battery so he's going to wear his batteries down that's why we limited the amount of runtime because there's no sun in the amazon anaconda so charging batteries is rather hard so that's the routine that actually does the you know, converts the characters into morse code the other board that's very popular with the people who like to program in C, the C programming language, I think uh, any recent graduates from computer science would be uh, you know, very uh, well schooled in the C programming language. This is the Arduino, Arduino. It uses an AppMail chip, which you see is rather large. It has to sit on this rather large circuit board. It's about 60 by 90 millimeters. Uh, it does have a lot of input and output pins here and here, and there's a huge volume. Just like a 1955 Chevy with a uh, 265 V8 engine, you can go anywhere, buy any kind of accessory you want, same for here. You can drive motors, you can drive all your robots, whatever you want. And uh, what I was trying to show here is how you could take a typical circuit out of QST magazine that this is nothing more than a temperature sensor. And here's the sensor, and here's the pot to adjust at what temperature this thing's going to be. And here's another pot to once for fine tuning and once for coarse. Here's a comparator and an LED and all these parts. Well, you can do that with a temperature sensor and a pickaxe chip. That's it, that's all you need. It just shows you, you know, how you can reduce all the parts, make it a lot of fun, because you can add other sensors to it. Maybe you want a humidity sensor. This, uh, this circuit is in uh, CQ magazine. This is another good one that's typical, uh, that's easy to convert to a microprocessor. It's a modulated CW or a VHF, UHF handheld. So like a lot of uh, technician class uh, licensees, they want to learn Morse code. But obviously, there's no beat frequency oscillator in a handheld FM radio, because FM radios don't have beat frequency oscillators. So they modulate a, an audio signal, and they key it, and they transmit it over the air uh, to whoever is listening across town. So here's where the key hooks up, and here's the transistor switch that supplies power to the switch, and here's the, module, here's the oscillator to create the audio tone, 700 uh, hertz. So all this could be part of the, your program in the microchip, and this would be in the same microchip. This would be the input, one of the input ports for the key, and now when you key it, it's going to generate push to talk, because you have to have a push to talk going back to your little FM transmitter, right? So it's going to key that down for you to get rid of all that stuff. And then here is your side tone, so you can hear it yourself, you know, so you have some audio feedback. So anyway, all of this would be one pickaxe away the MG chip. Uh, of course, you do need a voltage regulator in this case. So we could even get rid of this because the pickaxe chip will run from 388 batteries. 